Peace be with you, and happy first Sunday of Advent to everybody. You know, when I was a high school student many years ago, a very wise uh, Benedictine nun, who was one of my history teachers, gave me a template for understanding Advent that is very simple but very clear, and I've never forgotten it. She said, Advent's about three comings of Christ. So Adventus just means arrival or coming. Christ came in history, Christ comes to us today, and Christ will come definitively at the end of time. Simple template, but really helpful. And I find the readings for our first Sunday of Advent correspond beautifully to this template. Let's take a look at the first reading, which is from the 33rd chapter of the prophet Jeremiah. And it speaks very clearly now of the historical coming of Christ. Listen, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and Judah. In those days, in that time, I will raise up for David a just shoot. Uh, Fulton Sheen, one of the heroes of uh, Word on Fire, said, The only religious founder whose coming was clearly predicted was Jesus. <laughs> and think about it. Uh, the Old Testament is filled with anticipations of the coming of the Messiah, this anointed figure. And when at last he came, his followers made reference constantly to those anticipations. How often in the Gospels you hear that little phrase, katatagrapha, which means according to the writings, according to the scriptures. So, Jesus is seen as the fulfillment of all the institutions of Israel. He's the definitive temple. He's the fulfillment of the covenant. He's the law or the Torah incarnate. All that Israel represented now came to its fullest expression in Jesus. He came in history 2,000 years ago, bringing Israel to fulfillment and becoming thereby the fulcrum of all history. He became the point by which we understand time. Isn't it marvelous, by the way, that still, at least in the West, but really all over the world, we still measure time by his adventus. We still speak of things, you know, when I was a kid, we said just before Christ, and then we said A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of the Lord. And we still gauge time just that way. And that speaks of a very important truth, everybody, that History does not climax in, let's say, the 18th century, which is what many moderns believe. You know, the 18th century with the great political revolutions, with the scientific revolution, that's when the modern world was born. Everything before that is, is dark and obscurantist. Everything after that participates in, in modernity and progress. The turning point of history is the 18th century. No, no, say Christians, not at all. In fact, the 18th century, yes, gave us many good things, but modernity? Eh, I don't know. It gave us a lot of bad things besides. That's not the fulcrum of history. Rather, the decisive moment, we look back now to the first historical Adventus Christi, the first coming of Christ, made all the difference, his dying and his rising. That's the still point around which all of history revolves. And so it's very important, everyone, on this first Sunday of Advent that we do indeed look back to that moment, to that time. Something happened. Something broke into history that was unexpected. And we do look back at it with deep spiritual attention. That's part of what Advent means. But now let's keep following my, uh, my high school uh, instructor. The second dimension of Advent has to do with the Adventus Christi, the coming of Christ, that is happening now. Not just a long time ago, but now in the life of the church. And here, our second reading, taken from one of the earliest Christian texts we have, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Some argue that's the very first letter that Paul wrote, certainly an early one. Listen to him. Brothers and sisters, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. We earnestly ask and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should conduct yourselves to please God. Now, what's Paul talking about here? 
But the coming right now of Christ into the minds and the hearts and, yes, indeed, into the bodies of those who follow him. You know, Paul would have known with all the first Christians that we live in this age now where Christ has sent his Holy Spirit to guide the work and activity of his church. Christ's Spirit now wants to dwell in us. Think of the image from the book of Revelation of Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts. Christ, right now, especially on this first Sunday of Advent, Christ coming right now, knocking on the door of your mind and your heart so that he might enter and then see, accomplish this. May he make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. That's the sign of the Adventus Christi in our hearts now, that we become more and more people of love. Now, in the first coming, he presented himself in the context of ancient Israel, right? emerging as the, as the climax of that history, the fulfillment of Israel. But now in this coming today, he presents himself in the context of the church. I always love uh, this image of me now. You hear my voice and so on. So in the same way, Christ can't be known apart from his body. And that means for us, his mystical body of the church. Church is not extraneous to Christ, not just a mere human organization entered into by those who follow him. No, it's much more dramatic than that, much more organic than that. The church is the vehicle by which Christ becomes present to his people. And so in the coming today of Christ, it's the context of the church that matters. So now we're talking about the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, the source and summit of the Christian life. We're talking about the saints, the witness of the saints. We're talking about the art and the architecture of the church. We're talking about good preaching. We're talking about the poor. Didn't Jesus say, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it to me. That's what I'm talking about. That's not the church as some little human organization off on the side. That's the church as the mystical body of Jesus. And so in the cry of the poor, in the face of the suffering poor, we have access to Christ who's knocking right now on the door of our hearts. Okay, so everybody, on this first Sunday of Advent, we do indeed look back at this decisive moment in history, and we look around right now, and we say, okay, the most important decision I can possibly make, more important than my decisions regarding my job or my education or even my family and my country, more important than any of those, is the decision, do I allow Christ into my life to become my Lord? And so on this first Sunday of the Adventus Christi, we look around. We listen for that knock on the door of our hearts. And are we willing and able to let him in? Okay, let's keep following my high school teacher. We look back to the coming of Christ. We look around to Christ coming now into our minds and hearts. And on this first Sunday of Advent, we look forward to the definitive coming of Christ at the end of time. Here's an important point, everyone, to, to see. For Christians, history has a trajectory. It's not just one thing after another, nor is it just a, a cyclical, you know, return of the same, a constant repetition over and over again. No, no. Those of us who come out of the biblical imagination know that history has a trajectory. It's moving somewhere. It's moving toward its culmination. It's about something. And what's it about? It's about Christ's second coming, we call it, when he comes, Adventus, at the end of time, to draw all things to himself, to bring history to its fulfillment and culmination. With that in mind, let's turn now to our third reading, the gospel for today. Jesus speaking to his disciples. Listen. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth nations will be in dismay. People will die of fright in anticipation of what is coming upon the world, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud 
with power and great glory. Reference there to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, by the way, the coming of the Son of Man on a cloud. But the important thing here is he's talking about the falling apart of the political order, all those things that govern human life, but even the falling apart of the cosmic structures. This old fallen world giving way to what the Bible calls a new heavens and a new earth. God's purpose is finally to save and transfigure and transform time and space and history and the earth and our very bodies. And that culminating moment we associate with the second coming of Christ at the end of time. Notice, please, everybody, that the church lives in this kind of in-between time. So looking back 2,000 years ago, that was the fulcrum of history, absolutely. The dying and rising of Jesus. And we measure time by that, things that came before it, things that come after it, because that was the moment. We look back. But then we also look forward to this definitive coming of Christ. And where do we live? Well, in the in-between zone. Has the battle been won, the decisive battle? Yeah, it has. In the dying and rising of Jesus, sin and death have been in principle conquered. But is the fight over? No, there's a kind of mop-up operation, if you want. I have often used that image of, this is for history buffs, after the, the Normandy invasion, right, in June 1944, you know, prescient people would have said, yeah, Hitler's finished. You know, once the Allies had broken through and it was just a matter of time before Hitler would fall, but yet there was still a lot of fighting ahead, including that terrible Battle of the Bulge in the winter of 44 or 45. Uh, there, was a, there was quite a, a slog ahead, even though the battle had essentially been won at Normandy, but we still had work to do before the war was finally over. Well, that's where the church lives, in between that fulcrum moment 2,000 years ago and the definitive coming of Christ. And in that in-between time, what do we do? Well, we, we try to welcome him into our hearts now so that we can get into his army and fight the good fight. So there's a way to think of, of the three comings, history, now, future, of how they are tied together. You know, just maybe a last thought. People wonder, like, especially for, for Christians who believe in, in God, they believe in Jesus and God's providence, how come our lives are still so fraught with danger and anxiety and failure? Well, because we're still waiting for the definitive coming. Notice, please, and, and once you see this, you start seeing it everywhere in the liturgy. The liturgy is constantly reminding us of the second coming. Just a couple of examples. Um, as we wait in joyful hope, for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're not talking there about his coming in time. That's happened. But now, in hope, so we're not there yet. We're still beset by anxieties, but in hope, we await the coming of our Savior. So, first Sunday of Advent, we look back, yep, fascinated by this turning point in history. We look around ready to make a decision right now to let Christ into our hearts. And we look forward that one day, at the end of time, when God will be all in all, history and the earth and our bodies will come to their fulfillment. And God bless you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Peace be with you. Friends, on this Feast of the Holy Family, so it's the very day after Christmas, uh, I'm aware that uh, we've all probably been with our families very recently, our, our immediate families, our extended families. And I want to tell you about a member of my extended family um, who's always caused me to, to reflect on things more spiritually and theologically. I'm talking about my Uncle Tommy. Uncle Tommy was my father's older brother, though he outlived my father by, by many years. And uh, Uncle Tommy was in the Second World War as a, he must have been in his early 20s in those days. And he was sent over to England and then over to Europe. And in 1944, in that winter of 44, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge. 
Anyway, he comes home from the war. And, you know, probably today we would say he was suffering from uh, post-traumatic stress or we'd have some way to diagnose what it was. But whatever happened to him over there affected him very negatively. And, uh, and Uncle Tommy just had a difficult time when he got home. Couldn't hold the job. He, he got several different jobs and never had them for very long. Fell into conflict or he, he was afraid to go to work or whatever. Um, he never married, so he couldn't really get his, his personal life quite uh, in order. And he was probably looked upon by a lot of members of, of his own generation as, you know, well, poor Tommy, you know, poor Tommy. Well, I'll tell you, though, we kids loved him. So as his siblings had kids, me and my cousins, we would gather at, at grandma's house for all the great events. And, you know, the adults were all there and, and they were, of course, good to us. But Tommy was especially um, our friend. He would play football with us. Uh, I have very vivid memories of uh, playing football on the street in front of my grandmother's house and Tommy acting as the, uh, the coach and the quarterback. And I learned a lot of sports as a kid from him. I remember um, going to uh, Angel Guardian Orphanage. Chicagoans know what I'm talking about. And, and racing with him around the, around the track. Uh, I remember playing basketball with him as a kid. The other great gift that, that my Uncle Tommy had was, I'm all Irish, both sides of my family, and he was like uber Irish. And um, had the Irish gift of storytelling and of, of jokes and humor. We, we just died laughing as he would tell us these marvelous stories, which he found <laughs> very amusing. And often, I think we laugh more at his, uh, his laughter. Anyway, he's marvelous, you know, raconteur, and he would tell us the stories, and he'd, he'd play sports with us, and, and he was just a, you know, he was a great friend. I think what happened to a lot of us cousins as we got older, we found that maybe we had kind of outgrown Uncle Tommy, you know, and then we began to move on with our, our lives and so on. Uh, he lived with my grandmother, uh, and she lived to be quite an old lady, and uh, when she died, Uncle Tommy was kind of was kind of lost. And, and you know, we got him an apartment and, um, you know, he would stay there for a time, but then he'd, he'd drink too much or he would, he would uh, you know, lose the place or whatever. It just was difficult to keep him, you know, kind of in one piece. So anyway, years go by and, and he, you know, he hung in there and, and he was a, a churchgoer. He was a man who, who uh, took in from his parents a deep Catholic faith and, and practiced it. Well, anyway, he becomes eventually a, a fairly old man, and uh, it was just, how shall I put it, kind of difficult for different reasons for Tommy to come to the, the family gatherings. So uh, my brother and I uh, conspired to uh, bring him to my brother's house on Christmas Eve or maybe a couple days before Christmas to have a special dinner with him. <laughs> so my job in those days was to get him at his apartment, which is always a little bit challenging, and then bring him to my brother's and then bring him back. Now, this is December 23rd, December 24th in Chicago, so usually it was miserable weather and snow and ice, and so I drive down to Uncle Tommy's apartment, and I would find him there and get him in the car. And by this time, he was pretty much deaf. <laughs> he could hear, we thought he could hear maybe a bit selectively, but he was pretty bad. And so we'd have these conversations in the car, and he was very attentive, in a kind of a beautiful way, to, to for want of a better term, the careers of, of you know, the, his nieces and nephews. He followed what we were doing. And my brother during those years was um, really uh, climbing the ladder in his um, chosen profession, which was, was the newspaper business. He was you know, a reporter, then editor, and, and then editor-in-chief of a certain section. And then finally, he became editor-in-chief of one of the big papers in Chicago. So he was really, you know, making his moves. So I'd be in the car with Uncle Tommy driving him, and he'd say, well, Johnny's doing really well. And I'd say, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, he's doing well. Yes, Johnny's doing well. Then it'd be a pause, and he'd say, and you're, you're still just a priest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still just a priest. What? Yes, I'm still just a priest. So that was sort of the nature of the conversation with Uncle Tommy. We get to my brother's house, and uh, I remember this very vividly. It was beautiful. He had, had a big bag, like a plastic bag or a garbage bag. It was filled with, I don't know where, where he got these things, but like toys and clothes for my brother's kids, who were very young at the time. And he'd come in the house literally like Santa Claus with the bag over his shoulder. And open up, 
I think my brother and sister in law would kind of take a careful look at what exactly was in that bag, you know, before the kids would play with it. But they they loved him too, the same way we did when we were their age. They they sensed even in this old man, you know, who's deaf and and it, you know very compromised. They they recognized this sort of loving spirit in him. Uh, Uncle Tommy died on New Year's Day. I think it was the year 2002, so I want to say almost exactly 20 years ago. And there's something poignant about the way he died because even with all his struggles and all his difficulties, um, he was a churchgoer, as I say. And he would go to Mass typically every day. He would walk from his apartment to church. And he was walking to Mass on New Year's uh, Day. And he stone deaf, so he, he didn't hear traffic very well. And he was struck by a car as he was on his way to church. And I, here's the, one of the great ironies. He was struck by a rabbi who was on his way to his church service. And uh, he, he, he died. That's how Tommy died. And so we all just were, you know, caught up in, the, in some, some of the irony and, and, and in some way the poignancy and beauty of, of his death. And... I remember preaching at his um, at his funeral, and I said, "Well, Tommy was always disappointed that I was still just a priest." So I said, "If I become a monsignor in the next couple of weeks, we know that he's he's in heaven." <laughs> anyway, why do I tell you the story about Uncle Tommy? Because I'd be willing to bet almost everybody listening to me has got someone in your family like uh, Uncle Tommy. I bet everyone's got someone who's maybe not you know completely put together someone whose life kind of got off the rails at a certain point, someone who doesn't quite fit in, maybe is a little bit eccentric. And you probably spent some time with them just in the last couple of days. What do families teach us? One lesson I think is we don't always get to choose the people we love. But we're given people that were then called upon to love. So there were, you know, lots of people in my family, my extended family, who were very lovable, who had, you know, nothing but good qualities and were easy to spend time with. Then someone like Uncle Tommy, who, who did have marvelous qualities, who was a, a dear friend to us, especially when we were kids, but who was also, I don't know, kind of a difficult personality. Maybe be pretty easy to say, oh, you know, Tommy, I, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with him. But I think God, through our families, is giving us the people he wants us to love. And part of what makes our families holy is that we have this capacity, that we cultivate this capacity to love not just the people that we like, that we have chosen to be with, but the people whom God has given us to love. Here's something else, and I think a second spiritual lesson I'll take from the Uncle Tommy story. So our family had this uh, kind of wonderful, quirky, eccentric figure, Uncle Tommy, part of our extended family. When the Word became flesh, when God became human, God entered into a family. Now, now, I mean, the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, two of the greatest, most sublime saints in our entire tradition, yes, yes, they were the most intimate members of his immediate family. Do you ever wonder, though, what were the Virgin Mary's cousins like? <laughs> what were her second cousins like? I'd be willing to bet there were some eccentric figures among those people. The Blessed Mother, I mean, of course, but her second and third cousins, the people that might show up at family gatherings, I bet there were a few, you know, odd, quirky figures. How about Joseph's side of the family? Did Joseph have an eccentric uncle or a great uncle or a cousin or a nephew? Did Jesus have cousins who were maybe a little bit difficult to be with? They didn't quite know what to do with them? Yeah. In fact, go into those great genealogies in the Gospels that tell the story of Jesus' extended family going back in time. Are there heroes? Yes, indeed. But are there a lot of shady characters, too? You bet. 
A lot of questionable figures, absolutely. And here's the point, everybody, my second spiritual lesson. God saw fit to enter into just such a family. God saw fit to enter into this intimate connection, yes, with the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph, but also <laughs> all these other people that were connected to them. All these different relatives, all these quirky members, undoubtedly, of their family. God loved them, too. Love the heroes, you bet, and love those who were a little bit off kilter. And see, that's the reason why we are called to love those that God has given us to love. Not just those that we like, not just those that we choose, but the ones that God has given us to love. So maybe uh, on this Holy Family Sunday, I say in a special prayer for Uncle Tommy, who was a, a good friend to me when I was a kid and uh, who was a marvelous figure and a, you know, a, a quirky, eccentric, flawed figure too. Okay, maybe you can say a prayer for the Uncle Tommy in your life and realize that you're called upon to love, yeah, all those that God has given you to love because that's the way he entered into the human family. And God bless you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I invite you to share it and to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Aaron. I'm Father Ryan Lerner. I'm the eighth chaplain here at St. Thomas More, and I'm joined this evening by student leader Ali Eidemuller and assistant chaplain Carlene Demiani. And it is now my distinct privilege to welcome and introduce Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron is the founder of Word on Fire Catholic Ministries and Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He is also the host of Catholicism, a groundbreaking, award-winning documentary about the Catholic faith, which aired on PBS. Bishop Barron is a number one Amazon best-selling author and has published numerous books, essays, and articles on theology and the spiritual life. He is a religion correspondent for NBC and has also appeared on Fox News, CNN, and EWTN. Bishop Barron's website, wordonfire.org, reaches millions of people each year, and he is one of the world's most followed Catholics on social media. His regular YouTube videos have been viewed over 50 million times, and he has over 3 million followers on Facebook. Bishop Barron has been invited to speak about religion at the headquarters of Facebook, Google, and Amazon. He has keynoted many conferences and events all over the world, including the World Youth Day in Krakow and the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, which marked Pope Francis's historic visit to the United States. He has shared dialogue with Dr. Jordan Peterson, Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro, and William Lane Craig, among other influencers and thought leaders. Bishop Barron's recent film series, Catholicism, The Pivotal Players, has been syndicate, syndicated for national television and nominated for an, M, for an Emmy Award. His most recent project is the Word on Fire Institute, a new hub for spiritual and intellectual formation, training members of the Word on Fire movement to proclaim Christ in the culture. Bishop Barron, on behalf of all of us here at St. Thomas More Catholic Chaplain Center at Yale, Archbishop Blair, the ordinary of this archdiocese, the Archdiocese of Hartford, welcome and thank you for being with us tonight. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you. Even though it has to be virtual, but I'm still uh, happy to have at least this contact with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. At this point, uh, Bishop and everyone, I'm going to pass it off to Assistant Chaplain Carlene Demiani to lay down the ground rules. Yes, well, thank you again, um, Bishop Barron, for being with us tonight. And a special thank you to all of our viewers who are tuning in tonight as well to this uh, webinar. And um, we look forward to asking as many of your questions as we can. You can submit questions two ways. Uh, one way is via the chat. The other is the Q&A box at the bottom of, in your toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, because we are a campus ministry, we'll, we will be prioritizing student questions. So students, please identify yourselves with your questions. Let us know if you're a grad or an undergrad and um, what you're studying. Father Ryan, Ali, and I will be monitoring the questions, and we will be uh, choosing the ones that we ask Bishop Barron. And so without further ado, I turn it over to Ali, who will open us with a prayer. 
Thank you, Carleen. And thank you again, Bishop Barron, for speaking with us today. I thought we could quickly start with a prayer to ask for the Holy Spirit to guide this Q&A. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same Spirit, help us to relish what is right, and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. With that, I will now pass this over to Carlene, who has our first question from a student. Okay. Um, great. Um, Bishop Barron, last year, the undergraduate student leaders and I read your book, Letter to a Suffering Church, and we were particularly moved by Chapter 5, The Way Forward, when you talked about how different times throughout the church's history, God has raised up amazing saints, new orders have been created, and we've seen these pockets of resiliency and hope. And this year has obviously been a very difficult year in the church's history in the midst of this COVID pandemic. So I'm wondering if we might start start on a hopeful note, and if you might be willing to share any sort of pockets of hope and resilience that you've seen in the church within this past year. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, yeah, I wanted to end that book very much on that hopeful note. And I, I got the inspiration there from Cardinal George, who was kind of a mentor to me. The Archbishop of Chicago died about five years ago, because um, he would always say in the midst of the, of the crisis, okay, where are the movements? Where are the orders? Where are the saints? Because that's the way it typically worked. During times of crisis, that's when the Lord would call forth um, heroes of the faith. And, I mean, I see them all the time. I, I think, especially among uh, younger Catholics, it was my privilege to be rector of Mundelein Seminary for three years. And there I dealt with, you know, young men discerning the priesthood. And the fellows I dealt with, without exception, came of age and discerned their vocation during this darkest time in American Catholic Church history. And I would often ask them, you know, what was that like? Because when I was discerning priesthood, um, you know, the priesthood was still very much on a pedestal. There was still a very high sense of, of Catholicism, of religion in general in our culture. A lot of that, as you know, has even asked. Well, I'd ask them that question, what was it like? And they would almost to a person say something like, I want to be part of the solution. So they, they knew all about the scandals. They knew all about you know, people's suspicions of the church. But they felt the call to be, um, you know, new Samuels, as the Lord raised up Samuel at a time of great crisis in the history of Israel. They wanted to be new um, Francis's and Dominic's, you know, new Ignatius's of Loyola, uh, these figures that arose precisely in times of crisis. So I see in, in younger Catholics such as many, I'm sure, who are listening tonight, that to me is the great sign of hope. Those who have hung in there despite these difficulties, God knows there's been disaffiliation. I, I've been following that now for some years, especially younger people who are just saying, I have no religion at all. But I, I see all the time those signs of young people that want to be part of the solution, that are still fired by the best of the Catholic tradition, um, that gives me a lot of hope. I know most directly these young men interested in the priesthood, but I see young Catholics all the time that have that, uh, that fire to be part of, of uh, the reform. Thank you, Bishop. Our next question from a student is, seeing that Islam is the fastest growing religion, how do we reach out to Muslims? Second, what is your view on Muslim, on the use of Muslim theology for Catholics? Yeah, good. I don't claim to be any great expert, really, on the question of, of Islam. I first came across Islam in a very positive way in my own life because I was a student of St. Thomas Aquinas. And, of course, Aquinas famously uses Aristotle and Plato and Cicero and the classical philosophers. He also uses people like Moses Maimonides from the Jewish tradition. But he's also very happy to use the great... Um, uh, Islamic philosophers. Think of, you know, Al-Farabi and Averroes and Avicenna. So I came across the Islamic intellectual tradition when I was a young man and found it very powerful and saw how Aquinas, our greatest theologian, used it with great, uh, you know, interest. So that, that was my first introduction to Islam was a, was a very positive one. Um, 
You know, in terms of the, the dialogue between Catholicism and Islam or Christianity, um, it's obviously a delicate question, you know, given the, the recent history uh, culturally. I just think you, you always declare uh, Jesus Christ. That's the heart of evangelization. And that's in season and out. That's when it's popular to do so and when it's, when it's unpopular. That's when it's culturally um, uh, agreeable, culturally disagreeable. So that's what we do t- with anybody, is we talk about, about Jesus. Um, you know, one point of contact, of course, is the presence of Jesus in the Quran. And again, I don't claim any great expertise here, but um, Jesus is a clear, you know, a prophetic figure in the Quran, reverenced. Mary, it's often pointed out, mentioned far more frequently in the Quran than in the Bible. So there are those points of contact, Mary and, and uh, Jesus. Think of Vatican II that points out, you know, uh, Islam with its belief in the one creator and providential God who will um, judge all people. Well, those are points of contact. So I, I would always emphasize that. Let's start with what we have in common. But finally, the end of the day, evangelization means declaring uh, Jesus Christ risen from the dead. So, you know, I, I think you do both those things. You, you find points of contact. Again, for me, the Islamic intellectual tradition is a very important point of contact. And then declare Jesus as Lord. Go ahead. Thank you, Bishop. This also comes from the Q&A from a grad student in theology at Yale Divinity School. The question is, do you think the normalcy of sex outside of marriage in our culture has kept people from coming to the church? And if so, how can we explain the Catholic way in a manner that is both compelling and charitable? Yeah, the first part, I was just missing, I was having trouble with my earpiece here. The first part was, does the teaching on sexuality, say it again, just please, the first part of the question. Sure. So do you think the normalcy of sex outside of marriage in our culture has kept people from coming to the church? Yeah, okay. Um, Yeah, I suppose so. In survey after survey, you'll find that people quarrel with about four or five basic things when they disaffiliate. Um, The moral questions are not in the first place, which I think is important. People's questions about God, about suffering, about the distinctiveness of Christianity, I think, are more fundamental. But almost invariably, the church's sexual teaching becomes a block for people. So I, I would say, yes, we're certainly a countercultural voice when we talk about sex having an a objective sort of uh, normativity. We talk about the, the proper and improper use of, of um, our sexual powers. Um, yeah, we stand to thwart the culture in many ways. And I think the more we articulate that teaching, the more we're going to turn off a lot of people in our, you know, very uh, secularized culture. So I, I don't deny that for a minute. But I think we just have to be clear, confident, and bold. Um, not aggressive, you know, not judgmental, but proposing this form of human sexuality that has roots, of course, in the Bible itself, but also in the, in the great philosophical tradition, that was taken for granted by the overwhelming majority of, of at least Western civilization up until very recent years. And I think we should declare that with, with confidence. Always proposing it with love, never imposing it or never uh, coming across in a judgmental way. But I think that there's a normativity to um, our, our sexual expression. That's something we shouldn't hide and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Is it causing us trouble in evangelization? Probably, you know, again, given the way our culture is. But, you know, so it goes. There's always been things that have, that have blocked the church's evangelization. But I think we just propose it confidently and, uh, and joyfully. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you so much, Bishop Barron. Um, we have a question from a student who's a senior in chemical engineering, but it's not a chemical engineering question. <laughs> um, <laughs> she is wondering, um, as we approach Lent, can you talk a little bit about what you decide to give up or add on as a spiritual practice during this Lent? And do you, might you be willing to share with us, if you've already figured it out, what you'll be doing for Lent? 
Yeah, I mean, I always follow the church's basic you know, prescription, so in terms of abstinence and fasting and that sort of thing. I, I always, um, typically on Ash Wednesday, I'll preach on you know, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And I try to do something that's related to each of those three things. So I do a, a holy hour every day, and I have a basic routine of, of prayer. But I try in some way to intensify that. I'll add something to it or add some more time or something. Um, I'm not good at fasting. I'll confess that. I'm like Fulton Sheen. He always said he wasn't good at fasting. So I kind of stay with the church's basic abstinence and fasting, you know, rules during Lent. Um, almsgiving, I always um, try to do something special during Lent. And things I've done in the past are real simple. Um, now with COVID, <laughs> maybe it's different, but whatever you would typically tip at a restaurant, I'll up that during Lent. Um, sometimes I'll resolve that whatever request is made of me, let's say by mail, you get someone will be asking for money, even though I know it gets me on all kinds of mailing lists, <laughs> that I will respond to those. I, I will do something. Sometimes I've um, decided to tithe in a special way, you know, giving a 10% of your income. Um, so I, I try with those three uh, categories, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, to do something uh, a little more during Lent. And I probably have the hardest time with fasting. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. Our next question is from a junior who is a pre-med. What are some opportunities for evangelization that the coronavirus pandemic has produced? Hmm, that's good. Yeah, I, we're all kind of wrestling with that issue of, of the COVID. And, you know, I've said it's, it's both a blessing and a curse. I've experienced that way for this past year. The curse is kind of obvious how it's distanced us from each other and but the blessing for me, I mean, a lot more time for prayer and study. So my life as a, as a bishop, I, it's a lot of traveling around and going to meetings and getting on airplanes and cars. And So the fact that that was cut back a lot during COVID helped me to move more deeply into prayer and study. Um, I wonder, you know, for evangelization, so just working on your own evangelizing skills, that's true. But I wonder if Zoom... I wonder if Zoom is going to be an opportunity because we've all learned how to use this more effectively. In some ways, it's facilitated our, our contact with each other. And um, I don't know. I wonder if we, could, if we could reach out evangelistically using Zoom in a way that we didn't really imagine before. Um, but maybe it's, the, it's your own personal deepening during this time. Blaise Pascal, I, on this Feast of St. Blaise today, Blaise Pascal um, said that most of us spend most of our time seeking uh, distractions or diversions from the great questions. You know, the great questions of life and meaning and death and salvation. And we divert ourselves. He was a, he was a gambler, so he loved to just go and, you know, use his brilliant mind to gamble. But he realized it was a diversion. Well, COVID in some ways has, has cut back on that. A lot of our diversions have been taken away from us. Well, that allows you to come to grips with the deeper questions, and that's essential for evangelization. If you're going to share the faith, you've got to have it in a deep way. So I wonder if that's maybe the best opportunity COVID's given us for that. Bishop, a question on the problem of evil. This comes from an MBA studying entrepreneurship in tech. Okay. Um, asks, when bad things happen, bad things happen to good people. Yeah. How can we discern if it is a test from God, the work of the evil one, or just an occurrence of the material world, you know, thinking on COVID and the pandemic or other you know, disasters? Right. You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily separate those out into, into such stark categories because I'm with uh, Jean-Pierre de Caussade, the great uh, Jesuit spiritual master, who said everything that happens is in some sense the will of God meaning either actively so, that God is actively willing something, or at least God is permitting it. So either in his active or his permissive will, everything that happens is the will of God. So you say, well, that's happening just you know, through nature or through happenstance. Well, yeah, if, it, one way of squinting at the world will give you that. But behind even that is at least God's permissive will. You know, So the sovereignty of God, I think, should be acknowledged even you know, as we acknowledge other forms of, of causality. Um, which then, of course, leads to the, the natural question. 
So why? Why would God either actively or permissively allow these things to happen? Um, and then we're back to our classic answer, which is God is so good that he can draw good out of certain evils that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Now, can we see that sometimes? And the answer is yes, I think. We can see it sometimes in our ordinary experience that certain goods happen only because of certain forms of evil or suffering. It's only because of that that this particular form of the good emerged. Anyone that has had to go through a struggle and then some great virtue emerges and they realize it would never have happened apart from the struggle. Or someone that was so keen on, on this relationship or going to this school and then it was blocked and that caused enormous suffering, but then it led them to a far greater good. And they realized, gosh, if, if I'd gone down that first path, I would never have experienced the, the good that I have now. So we can see it sometimes, not all the time, but we have the confidence that God's providence is such that whatever he wills, actively or permissively, is for our good. Again, hard to see, but in an act of faith, and it's a reasonable act, we know that God exists. We know that God is, is nothing but love. Therefore, whatever happens to me, good or bad in the conventional sense, is ultimately God's will. And if I can move into that, then I can find you know, deeper life. You know, I don't know if, if uh, you or your listeners um, know this book. I'm just reading it now. Uh, the Jesuit Walter uh, Chizek, you know, who was a um, uh, Jesuit who went over to Russia in the 1920s and, and 30s to minister kind of, you know, behind enemy lines, so to speak, captured by the Russian authorities, and then spent 23 years in the Soviet prison system, including Siberia at hard labor. But what's so moving in that book is this man is going through some of the worst suffering of anyone in the 20th century. And this, this lively faith and confidence. One of the books he wrote is called He Leadeth Me. That, that even during all this time, he knew that God was leading him, you know? Take a look at his, his books. They're very illuminating on this problem of why would God allow certain forms of evil? Well, I don't know all the time, but I do have confidence that I'm being led. I'm being led, and there is a good in God's uh, ultimate design. I know, that's a, that's a totally inadequate answer to, you know, the question of questions. Thank you so much, Bishop. That's a... It's an awesome book as well. So uh, yeah, thank you, know, you for raising yeah. it. It's great. Thanks. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we have a few questions regarding um, the current uh, sort of political situation in our country. One question, particularly from a law student um, who says uh, he'd like to ask you how we can respond to the polarization of American church Catholicism that we're seeing right now, particularly that we saw, um, you know, with Archbishop Gomez's inauguration message and kind of what happened after that. So, um, you know, how can we sort of respond to these very different versions of Catholicism emerging along political lines? And do you see any places of unity right now for American Catholics? Oh, yeah. And uh, let's stay with that, that first instance of the, um, the Gomez statement, you know, on the day of the inauguration. I think the differences among bishops on that are really not that severe. They might be questions of strategy. But, you know, you look at Archbishop Gomez's statement. Of course, he's my boss out here in Los Angeles. Um, he said nothing that we've not been saying for 50 years as bishops in this country. So the very generous outreach to uh, the political left, and there are indeed a lot of elements of Catholic social teaching that are congruent with the great um, uh, objectives of the, Catholic, of the left-wing political situation. And he names all those very clearly, from immigration to the environment, et cetera, to the poor. And then he very clearly names... Uh, the church's opposition to, uh, to abortion, you know, as well as to euthanasia, capital punishment. Uh, we've been saying this for 50 years. I mean, might some bishops disagree about, about timing, about strategy? Yeah, okay. I, I frankly get a little impatient with the whole, you know, who's being more positive and being negative. I think you do both. You know, you build bridges and you build walls. Uh, I have this in my album collection from years ago. The great John Lennon did an album called Walls and Bridges. 
And, you know, he's right. You need both. You build bridges to be sure when you can, and, and you try to find points of contact. Absolutely. So I read Archbishop Gomez as, as building lots of bridges in that statement. You also build walls when you have to, namely to say, look, this is what we stand for, and, and we are affirming our own integrity, and we, we can't just knock down every wall that defines who we are in the interest of, of togetherness. You build walls when you have to and bridges when you can, I think is the right way to look at it. If you just say, look, I'm all walls or I'm all bridges, I think that's simplistic. So I, the bottom line is I don't think there really is that great a difference among the bishops. It's more, as I say, practical strategy or timing um, disagreements. But the substantive teaching, I think he said nothing that we haven't said for the past 50 years. Um, and then, you know, the general question, which is a good one, uh, stay with that image, you know. The church, as it moves into the culture, this has been true from, from Paul, St. Paul, to the present day, the church assimilates what it can from the culture, it resists what it must from the culture, walls and bridges. And that's, that's the formula, you know. There's a simple-minded conservatism that would say, let's just build nothing but walls, there's also a simple-minded liberalism that would say we're all about bridges. Well, we're not either all about assimilation or all about resistance. Rather, we've got to be like a, like a, 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 a canny animal making its way through the environment, adept enough to know when to assimilate, when to resist. And so that what happens in the political discourse very often is everyone says, no, no, you're this or you're that. You're a walls person, you're a bridges person. I'm like, ah, come on. That's simplistic stuff. And then it does divide us, you know, that we start thinking, oh, I guess that's right. I must be in one or other of these camps. No, I mean, the smartest people in our tradition have always done both those things. Uh, read whether it's Augustine or Thomas Aquinas or John Henry Newman or any of them. They're both walls and bridges people. Thank you, Bishop. Our next question is from an undergrad considering converting to Catholicism. Mm. She asks, all of our sins are extremely grave. Why exactly is the sacrament of confession necessary for the forgiveness of mortal sins? Yeah, good. The question about, uh, about confession. Um, you know, to be perfectly uh, uh, clear about it, can one receive the forgiveness of God apart from the sacrament of confession? Yes, we would say with a perfect act of contrition, if one is perfectly contrite and, and seeks the forgiveness of God. In other words, God is not constrained by the sacraments of the Catholic Church, but rather God has deemed that this is the ordinary means by which he wants to express his forgiving love to his people. So, so strictly speaking, if you want to use the word necessary, it wouldn't exactly apply. I would say there's a kind of um, sacramental necessity about it because God has so determined this is the way he wants to express his forgiving love to his people. And that's, of course, grounded in Jesus himself, you know, who is the, the font and the source of forgiveness. The sacrament is simply the priest operating in persona Christi, right, in the person of Christ, who's offering the Lord's uh, forgiveness. Then, to, looking at a more practical level, I love confession. I think it's one of the great things we have in the Catholic Church. And I've been going to confession since I was seven years old. Right? I went to confession just a, a few weeks ago. You know I'm saying? All my life I've been going to confession. And I find it to be this marvelous spiritual experience because it's the, it's the way in which the priest in the sacrament is present to you in such a vivid way as the presence and voice of Christ. In other words, it's not an abstraction that I, I'm kind of dealing very uh, abstractly and, and at a distance with Christ, but rather it's Christ made sacramentally present in, in this person, and in this voice, and in the gesture. Um, Aquinas said that all the sacraments have both matter and form because we're not angels, right? We're made of body and souls, and so we need both those elements. And I find that very vividly uh, real in the sacrament of, of confession. Um, so I think for all those reasons, it's a marvelous uh, sacrament, and it's, it's the way Christ wanted to express his forgiveness to his people. Um, you know, th th those are a few observations about it. Uh, but I, I wouldn't see it as a burden. I see it as a wonderful 
gift. It's a wonderful grace and opportunity. We have a few questions about um, bearing witness to the faith uh, in, in, in this culture, and particularly among university students, um, both undergrad and grad, um, and concerns, you know, being identifying as a person of faith and a member of the Catholic Church can be challenging, of course, let alone bearing witness to their faith or evangelizing their peers. Some feel compelled uh, sometimes to keep their faith a secret, while others fear social ostracization or, or professional repercussions um, for just identifying uh, as a person of faith or as a Catholic especially. Um, we have questions here about discerning or vocalizing a yes to a vocation, and it's a culture that doesn't recognize or understand their call. And finally, one year about how best to discern whether we should evangelize more by the faith implicit in our example or by means of explicit argument for why Catholicism is true, good, and beautiful. So there's a lot there. Yeah, they're all um, good basically questions. Bearing witness authentically to their faith in a culture that obviously is. Um, yeah, they're all good questions. And, you know, after years of, of trying to do this and, and to think about it and practice it, I would say there's, there's no one way. I think evangelists have to be, as I say, sort of canny and um, adept, like a tennis player that's able to react to the ball. You know, if you're just someone that hits the forehand, well, your opponent will just keep hitting your backhand. If you're not quick to your right, he'll, you know, he'll hit that way all the time. You gotta be ready to move in whatever direction. I find sometimes with people, the mind is extremely important to address blocks in the mind or intellectual uh, puzzlements and difficulties. Good, so be equipped as an apologist, uh, know the church's intellectual tradition, know what the typical questions are. For other people, that is not a major concern. Uh, they're much more attuned to something like the liturgy. They're much more attuned to beauty. Use the beauty of the church, even to invite someone to come to Mass, or even to come into the church. Let me just show you some things here. Maybe you're a more aesthetically minded person, and there's a beautiful church that I can use to illustrate the faith. Other people are much, much more attuned, as the uh, questioner suggests, to the moral life and to the works of justice and love. And if you can say, yeah, in, in my own life, I'm going to witness to that. And they say, wow, that, that's beautiful. That's, that's attractive to me. So I've used examples there of, of the good, the true, and the beautiful, the three transcendentals. And the canny evangelist has got to be able to handle all those and to figure out which one corresponds to the needs of the people he's dealing with. Um, so public witness, I'm all for it when it's right and appropriate. Maybe sometimes a more subtle approach is going to be more effective. Um, I don't mind people getting up. Think of like Hyde Park Corner in London you know, years ago when people just get up and they just start talking about their faith. Okay, fine. If that's the right setting, people might respond positively. Good. Um, the aesthetic might be better. The moral might be better. Just depends on whom you're dealing with. Another natural way to do it, too, is just let questions emerge. So instead of coming at people with a whole predetermined program, is find out what's on your mind. What interests you? What are your, your concerns about religion? Or what are your questions about it? Let those emerge and then structure your response uh, accordingly. But it's, um, that's in some ways, the, it's the challenge of it, but also the fun of it, I find. You know, just like this, I'm a, I'm a golfer. Every golf hole is different. Every, every hole is a different set of challenges. And if you're good at just one part of the game, you're not going to do well over 18 holes. And a well-designed course is going to challenge all the different parts of your game. Well, every human being now, it's like, it's like a different... It's like a different golf hole. There's a whole set of challenges here now with this person that are different from what I, I, I had before. All right, be, be agile. Or that's why it's good to have a friends and a team. You say, well, look, I'm, I'm pretty good at the apologetic side of this, but I'm not as good at the, on the aesthetic side. You're, you're better at that. Good, good. Use what you can. Uh, move as you must. Um, and be a canny reader of people's hearts and minds. Um, that's a quick answer to, to all those subtle questions. 
So Bishop Aaron, we have a question from a recent graduate who's um, now researching applied Catholic social teaching at Notre Dame. Oh. And uh, she said that she and her fiance are big fans of yours. And uh, she's wondering if you have any words of hope for women who love the church dearly, but are frustrated and discouraged by their exclusion from its hierarchical structure um, and an exclusion that can at times feel like it disregards the importance of their voices. Yeah, I know I get that. Obviously, in most of my life, you know, I've, I've heard that concern coming from women. I understand it. And I, I always want to stress here the importance of, of sanctity. Uh, the great women saints, you know, I, in the Catholicism series, my documentary of a couple years ago, I, I celebrated someone like Edith Stein, um, one of my great heroes. I celebrate Dorothy Day, you know, whom I've, I've loved, the little flower in her own very unique way. Uh, the Mother Teresa of Calcutta, you know, most obviously perhaps. With the possible exception of, of John Paul II and John the Twenty Third, maybe, these women were more powerful than any cleric or any hierarch in the last 150 years. By far, far more important in their impact on the life of the church, far more important in the way they unleashed uh, grace into the world. So I would encourage um, women to, to, there's a huge field of opportunity which is called um, sanctity, which is called moving into the space opened up by Jesus Christ and to live that as boldly and creatively and passionately as you can. Taking Teresa of Calcutta, Dorothy Day, Edith Stein, look at Edith Stein, I mean, they say uh, Husserl's two greatest students were Martin Heidegger and Edith Stein. I mean, so one of the leading intellectual lights of the 20th century and also a martyr at Auschwitz. I mean, someone who who lived her Catholic faith so radically that she was able to give her life away. Um, Dorothy Day, for obvious reasons, I mean, who kind of revolutionized the way we think about Catholic life in our country. Um, the Little Flower, in her very unique way, now a doctor of the church. So I guess I, I would say, and I hope it, it never sounds like I'm, I'm trying to run around the question, but be a saint. And saints have far, far more power than, than clerics or hierarchs do. Thank you, Bishop. Our next question is from an undergrad student who's studying philosophy. She asks, first, or she asks, first, there is clearly a crisis of belief in the Eucharistic presence as shown by recent polls. Why do you think there is such a crisis? Second, can you explain that the church's often contested stance that the Eucharist is reserved solely for Catholics who, who adhere completely to all church teaching and are in a state of grace? Yeah, I've talked about that uh, Pew Form study a couple years ago. In fact, I brought it to the attention of the um, uh, administrative committee of the USCCB because at the time I was chair of the evangelization committee and as such I was on this administrative committee. And I brought up that um, study and I said, brothers, I think this is something we should be really concerned about, that 70% of our own people um, don't believe in the real presence. And so that launched, I'm not sure what's going to happen now because I'm no longer chair of that committee, but um, a real desire to re-emphasize the Eucharist and using those three uh, uh, categories again of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Uh, the true, to study the real presence, to understand what that means. The good, the implications of Eucharist for the transformation of the world and making a more just society. The beautiful, all the liturgical um, uh, you know, activity and, and practice around the Eucharist. So that's what we need to do, I think, is, is revitalize our sense of, of the Eucharist, for sure. Uh, the second part of the question was about why it's reserved to um, those in the state of, of grace. Is that, was that the question again? Yes, that was the second part. Well, you know, the, the ground of that is, we didn't make that up, that's in Paul. You know, so Paul says, do not approach the, uh, the body of the Lord uh, unworthily, or you eat and drink your own condemnation. And so, you know, that's not some rule imposed in the Middle Ages or in modern times. That's an entirely biblical idea that, uh, that one should approach the real presence of Jesus in, uh, in spiritual um, health. It doesn't mean you're a saint, you know. The way Thomas Aquinas put it, I think the issue of mortal sin came up too. Uh, Thomas said, of course, the sacraments are medicine for the sick. 
but he said, you don't give medicine to dead people. And someone in a state of truly mortal sin is in a state of kind of spiritual death. So they need to be uh, brought back to the state of grace before they can even benefit from the medicine that's offered in the, uh, in the other sacraments. Um, but the, the ground of that is in St. Paul. Um, it's not a, an arbitrary rule that we've imposed. So maybe a somewhat contentious question. Um, specifically about the, there's, there's a lot, the Archbishop's line in the letter that the second initiative proposed by the working group so develop, this is a conference statement from the U.S. CCB, I believe, on the church's Eucharistic coherence. Does that give you pause? Some prominent Catholic publications I follow have cautioned against weaponizing the Eucharist and driving a functional schism in the U.S. church. I assume this is probably in relation to the political circumstances, yeah. political atmosphere. Right now. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get the complexity of that. I actually subscribe. I mentioned Cardinal George earlier as kind of a mentor to me. And when this issue came up, when he was Archbishop of Chicago, he said, I don't want to refuse the Eucharist to politicians. He felt that it would become almost overnight chaotic in a place like Chicago, where there were a lot of, you know, Catholic politicians. He had all these different parishes and all sorts of different ministers of communion. He just saw it as sort of a practically chaotic uh, scenario. Having said that, Cardinal George was a very strong uh, advocate of the church's positions in the social order, and I know this for sure, that he met with Catholic politicians that were under his, you know, sphere of influence and, you know, had pretty frank conversations with them about the positions they were taking. But he felt that the, um, the discipline of, of not giving to, to those politicians was not one that he would follow. I totally understand other bishops who, who uh, determine that in a different direction. Uh, I think to some degree that's a matter of prudential judgment on the part of an individual bishop. I also think that's a good instinct, that, that the Church doesn't pronounce so much from on high on this issue, but rather each individual bishop of a given politician should be the one who makes that determination. And I would say typically after a, a frank and personal conversation. So I, I understand that language of, of weaponizing and you know turning the communion rail into a place of of battle and dissension. No one wants that. At the same time, we're taking seriously what I, what I just said from St. Paul, that it's, it's inappropriate to approach the Eucharist um, um, you know, disrespectfully in that sense, if you're coming not in the, in the state of grace. So I, I understand that. I think that's important. But I would leave it to the individual bishop in dialogue with the politicians in question. Um, and recognizing that there might be differences in the way that's prudentially uh, determined. So Bishop Aaron, we have a few questions about um, spiritual practice. Um, one question from two undergraduate seniors. What would your practical spiritual advice be for young people on a very secular campus? And um, also, if you're willing to share any prayer practices that you do on a daily basis. Yeah, the last part is easy. I, as I mentioned, I do a holy hour every morning, um, very much under the influence of, um, of uh, the great Fulton Sheen, you know, who recommended that to everybody, especially to priests. Um, so I pray the, the office, the liturgy of the hours, which I'm obliged to as a priest. I've been praying that for, you know, 35 years now. Um, and I, I love that prayer, actually, because it contains, there's so much of the Bible in it, uh, the Psalms, and, and also the church fathers are part of the office of reading. So I find great joy in the Liturgy of the Hours, and nothing prevents a layperson from, from praying that same Liturgy of the Hours. I'm also a great devotee of the Rosary. Um, I pray that on a daily basis. I also love the, um, the Jesus Prayer, which is typical of the Eastern Christian traditions. I have that um, a kind of knotted rope, it's called a Shakti, that has the, um, uh, you count the, the Jesus Prayers on that. Uh, I love that practice. Um, so those are all things that I do in, in prayer. Uh, the first part of the question was about just the spiritual life in general and how to cultivate that. Especially for young people on a very secular campus. Yeah, it's, don't be intimidated by the secularity of the campus. Just you move into your own space and you make of your own soul a kind of temple. So I, don't, don't worry about the secular culture because, you know, we're built for worship. Uh, I think that's fundamental biblical anthropology. We're built for worship that we've been designed to give praise to God. 
And in that great act, we, we find integration in ourselves, that all the elements that make you up sort of cohere around the right praise of God. And then you become someone who radiates integration around you. Uh, the great biblical insight is that when we stop praising God, which doesn't mean we stop praising, by the way, it means we're praising something else. That means now we're giving worship to something else. What happens is, is I disintegrate, I, I become, I, I'm at war with myself, and I radiate disintegration around me. Um, so don't be intimidated by a secular culture. That's a culture that is inimical to what's best in us. You do it. Um, you know, if you're just starting with prayer, um, Thomas Merton, the great spiritual master, said um, when someone asked him that question, he said, take the time. <laughs> the most yeah. important thing is take the time. So whether it's, it's 15 minutes, it's 10 minutes at the beginning of the day, Something I recommend to people a lot is uh, pray in the car, because the car is like a little monastic cell. Most of us are alone in the car. Uh, when the windows are up, and, and I'm, maybe I'm stuck in traffic, but I can have a rosary hanging from the rearview mirror, um, I can spend some time in the car praying for all the people that have asked me to pray for them, uh, all the people I know who are suffering. Um, start with those simple moves, rosary, the Jesus prayer, taking time, um, Maybe morning is a better time for you. Maybe evening, right before you go to bed, whatever that time is. And even, too, I'd say this, to set up some space that's a prayerful space for you. It can be very simple. Some corner of your house or some, some maybe it's at your balcony or it's, it's in your bedroom or wherever it is. But set up a space, maybe with an icon or with some holy pictures, perhaps a candle, a scripture open, that signals to your, your body as well as to your mind that this is a holy time. Those are some, some simple recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Our next question is from a Divinity School student who asks, do you ever have moments or seasons of doubt about faith, about the church? If so, how do you approach that? And then a similar question is about book recommendations for someone who is doubting their faith. Yeah, good. You know, I, I'm kind of with Cardinal Newman on that one, because the, the word doubt is a very loaded sort of word, especially for moderns after Descartes, and, and there's such a stress placed on doubt. Um, uh, Newman said, you know, a thousand difficulties do not make a doubt. He took doubt to be a very, very serious state of, of mind, you know. And I guess I'd be with that, that sure, difficulties, anomalies, questions, puzzlements, times when I think you're would I be, feel stronger in faith? Times I, I might feel more tested in faith? Sure. I think there are seasons in life. Um, and, you know, I, most of my life I've been a, a professional theologian. So as a, as a reader and a teacher and someone who's been compelled to think about these things a lot, of course, theology specializes in difficulties. <laughs> it specializes in, well, what about this and what about that? So, sure. And remember this, too. When you're dealing with God, you are not dealing with an object in the world. You're not dealing with one more item that I can get my mind around. God is the ipsum esse, Aquinas says, right? God is the sheer act of to be itself, not a thing in the world that my, my eagle eyes can take in and my searching mind can figure out. So in a way, there's always the attitude of, I call it, trust, the need to trust in God, and that's frustrating to the mind that wants to know and wants to control. So in that sense, if you want to put it this way, doubt or difficulty, or it always accompanies the, the spiritual life. It just does. It's part of it, you know. Um, what do you do? That's where the community comes in, I think, is that we're not in this game alone, thank God. You know, if I were just, just me and God, and I'm trying to figure it all out. No, no, you, you got the whole community. That's why you go to Mass. As, as a Catholic, you go to Mass, and you listen to the Scriptures, and you're with people, and you sing with them, and you pray with them. And that's why you've got a spiritual director, as I've had since I was a kid. Um, that's why you've got spiritual friends to talk to. Uh, that's why you've got the community of your parish. Um, so I think those are all ways to... to um, to deal with the seasons you go through as a person of faith. Um, books to read on it, I mean, 
We can go on and on about that. It depends on, on what you're looking for, where you are in your, in your search. One that I, I've always loved is C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. I, I think is a great book as a, you know, a fundamental orientation to Christian faith, one that deals with a lot of the kind of standard uh, criticisms. Um, but, you know, any of the great classics, I think Augustine's uh, Confessions, for anyone at any point in the spiritual journey, because Augustine was, you know, I think of people listening to me right now, of, of college students or grad students, when Augustine was your age, I mean, I mean he's telling you about that time in the Confessions and all the ups and downs of his own spiritual journey. That's a marvelous book. Uh, one of my favorites, Thomas Merton, Seven Story Mountain. Uh, again, a young, very smart spiritual seeker uh, laying out his story. So, a couple suggestions. For more technical theology, we can go into, you know, Thomas Aquinas and everybody else, but maybe Lewis, uh, Augustine. Bishop, this one comes from uh, one of our students in the medical school. Many of my classmates and patients are in same-sex relationships. They feel that the Catholic teaching on homosexuality excludes them and looks on their love with judgment. How would you respond to them? Yeah, and it's, you know, this is, again is a, is a classic problem that's been raised now for a long time. And, and the church has said over and over and over again, we reach out to everybody in love, and we never want anyone in a same-sex situation to feel unloved. The, the church is, is meant to radiate the, the style and the substance of Jesus, which is always the outreach in, in love and compassion. So that remains absolutely first and absolutely in place. Uh, everyone, everyone is to be treated with the, the deepest uh, respect. At the same time, the church holds to a certain objective form to human sexuality and does not recognize a, a homosexual relationship as corresponding to that normativity, which is why it feels obliged to you know, make that claim. It tries to do both those things at the same time. And I realize for a lot of people that's just a hard combination to accept. Um, but I think that's what the church has consistently maintained uh, for a long time. I think we've gotten a lot better at the first part of that, of, of expressing uh, our, our love and our care and our concern for everybody, period. Um, but at the same time, hanging on to the normativity in regard to sex that comes from both biblical sources and I'd say from, uh, from philosophy and from reason. So one reason I'm always hesitant is I, I hate sort of from on high making pronouncements about people I don't know. You, you know, I, I think it's always better if the church, there's someone that you know that you can talk to, your pastor, uh, your priest, someone that, that knows you personally, is always a much better person to be in dialogue with. All I can do is kind of articulate these, these basic principles, but I realize that's kind of unsatisfying. Uh, I, I would say, you know, sit down with a, a priest that, that you trust, that you know loves you, and, uh, and talk to him. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, we have a question. If you could have dinner with one saint, who would it be and why? Oh, gosh, Thomas Aquinas. That's easy. I mean, my great hero. Uh, Thomas is the reason that I'm a priest. You know, I, I discovered him when I was a kid of 14, and it set me on a path I've never really left. So I took my Episcopal motto from him, uh, non nisi te domine, you know, nothing but you, Lord. Uh, Thomas Aquinas would be the saint I'd most want to have dinner with, provided that I, by some mystical infusion, was able to speak Latin fluently with him. You know, I can make my way through his Latin text pretty well, but if I'm having dinner with Aquinas, I'd like to speak his language, or if suddenly or mystically he could speak uh, English. But he's the saint I'd most like to have dinner with, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, the question is from a first year who asks, what are your thoughts on the Benedict option? Yeah, well, you know, I think at certain times in its life, the church feels the need to hunker down. So look at the great sweep of the church's history. One of, my, one of, my, one of the most intriguing periods, I think, in the fourth century, both East and West, 
some of the best and brightest people, think here of, of Jerome and Chrysostom, Augustine in the West, they, they took to the hills. They, they, they felt the need to withdraw from an increasingly corrupt uh, society. And in those places of, um, of withdrawal, they, they cultivated the Christian life. Now, bring it up to date, uh, the young Karl Wojtyla is in Krakow when the Nazis uh, come in. And this horrific persecution, right, ensues. Wojtyla literally jo joins his underground seminary where he hunkers down for a long time and learns the Catholic faith and learns his own Polish um, tradition and literature. But then, decades later, as Pope John Paul II, he brings forth what he had preserved. So the church goes through times when it has to, I think, withdraw, cultivate, savor, hunker down, but its purpose is always to go forth. The great image to me is, is uh, Noah's Ark, right? That during the time of the flood, there's a hunkering down on this ark and, and a microcosm of God's order is preserved. But then the minute it's possible, the, the doors of the ark are opened and out comes the life, you know? So the ark is an image of the church. See, it, it does hunker down at times when the culture turns very dysfunctional. And, and ours is, like most cultures, dysfunctional to a degree. And so the church has to sort of resist, as I mentioned, both the walls and bridges. But keeping in mind its ultimate purpose is never to stay up in the hills and, and turn in on itself and cultivate its, uh, its life. Its purpose is missionary. It's always to go out. So I, I would accept it in the, in, in the, uh, under the proviso that we're not meant for the hills, we're meant for the world, we're meant for transformation. But at times we might have to, we might have to hunker down a bit. Thank you, Bishop. And thank you again for taking the time for this Q&A this evening. My pleasure, would enjoyed you, it. Would you lead us in a final prayer and blessing? Sure. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious Lord, giver of all good things, we thank you for the many gifts you give us. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for the privilege you've given us of, of searching out your truth and your will for us. Lord, give us the prudence we need. Give us the wisdom we need. Give us the courage we need always to follow your will. And we make these prayers through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon all of you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen. Once again, a special thank you to everyone who joined us this evening, for our panelists, for Ali, for Carlene, for all who attended, and, and for your wonderful questions, uh, for, for carrying the, the conversation tonight. Um, great discussion. Finally, Bishop Barron, what an, what an outstanding evening. Thank you so much for your time and being My with us My pleasure. Tonight. Great being with Thanks all of you tonight. Great.